Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat Collins, uh, first on the list. I'd just like to give you an overview of the Grains program. Um, I was the program leader at the beginning, not through the whole time, but um, I guess the establishment of the program. <clears throat> and the key words, as we just heard, is market access for this program. Oops. Okay. So what I'd like to do is just... Uh, just talk about the challenge we faced at the time, the threat, the biosecurity threat, uh, the objectives of the program, just give you an idea of the sort of projects we did, uh, some of the things that I saw were the highlights, and, and just briefly review the impact. So all that's only going to take a few slides, don't worry. Um, so the challenge, uh, unlike our competitors, uh, we harvest grain at the beginning of summer in Australia, and we store it over the hottest part of the year. So that means there's quite a serious insect biosecurity problem. Uh, and not only that, the grain has to be stored for three months or, or more, usually up to uh, a year or so. Uh, so. And during that time, it has to be held market ready. So it has to be, you have to be able to protect that grain the whole period it's being stored. And the markets are very demanding and very competitive and they require that grain to be insect free because it's always inspected. They prefer nil residues and that gives you the extra value on, the, on your uh, commodity. And they still want the highest quality grain. It's an internationally competitive market. And when we went into the, the program started about 2007, we went into the CRC a little bit late, a couple of years after it started. And at that time, uh, the industry was relying almost solely on phosphine uh, fumigant. Uh, to achieve these biosecurity um, uh, aims. Um, and when we went into the, the, the CRC, the threat at the time was that a number of the major p pests were developing resistance to phosphine. And there's actually no viable replacement for phosphine. It was cheap, easy to use, accepted by markets as a nil treatment, nil residue treatment. And it was uh, quite we could see it was going to jeopardise our export markets and our domestic markets. All right, so the objectives of the program were to manage the resistance to phosphine, to extend the working life of phosphine, um, to develop cost-effective alternatives, uh, which is easy to say, but we've been storing grain in Australia since the end of the First World War, and it's a very mature industry, so finding alternatives is not easy, and it's also a low value commodity, so you just can't use anything. What you, find, what you use has to be cost effective. Uh, we wanted to understand the field ecology of the pest species. We knew a bit about what happens inside silos, but we didn't know anything about what happens outside silos, where they go, how they colonise, when they fly, how far they fly, those sort of questions. And we needed to build R&D capacity, particularly in Western Australia, where it was very weak. So just outline, just quickly, some of the sort of projects we did under those objectives. We had a monitoring program, a national resistance monitoring program. We developed a resistance diagnostic, a genetic diagnostic for resistance. Uh, we developed a national cooperative national resistance management strategy through the industry, cooperating with industry. Uh, we developed, developed new protocols under the second objective there. We looked at storage integrity, in other words, making storages work better fumigate better, store grain better. Uh, we looked at application uh, in central storages and on farms. Uh, we looked at the use of synergists and mixtures, that sort of approach. Then with cost-effective alternatives, we came up with um, a low oxygen technique using nitrogen, um, looked at ozone, chlorine dioxide. Uh, the program developed a new silica-based protectant, and we extended the use of aeration cooling for grain. The last one, the second last one, the field ecology of the pests. As I say, I've got written there, it's about know your enemy. So we looked at their movement, their colonisation, and resistance gene flow too, how resistance spreads through the, the, uh, the landscape. And the last one, build R&D capacity. Sorry about the two buildings there, not good editing. Um, we developed a new laboratory in Perth. So we had R&D capacity in Western Australia and in Eastern Australia. So these are just uh, highlights from me as the program leader. Uh, the first one there is the developing the molecular diagnostic for phosphine resistance. This was led by Paul Ebert and Dave Chapalius. 
Paul Ebert from UQ, Dave Palis from the Queensland Department. Um, this was just scientifically outstanding work, really world beating. And not only did they develop a molecular diagnostic, they found the resistance genes, they're two major genes. They worked out how the resistance worked, and along the way they worked out how phosphine works. We knew very little about it. So that's led to lots of leads for new, new fumigants, new synergists, all that sort of thing. So it's opened up quite a new field. Uh, again, the second one, the ecology of the grain pest, scientifically outstanding, world leading work. Not very much is known worldwide about these pests and this really broke new ground. Um, the resistance monitoring program, it just gave us a whole heap of baseline data so we could understand what was happening with resistance across Australia. And it was a great collaborative project between three state departments and the bulk handling companies and farmers obtaining that data. <laughs> and we really couldn't say much about this project or this program without that pro project. Uh, capacity building, we have to con congratulate uh, Prof Yong Lin Ren. He developed almost single-handedly a lab in Western Australia and so we had the R&D capacity over there. Collaboration was, for me, a real feature of this program. Um, researchers, industry, government, industry organisations, farm, we, <laughs> Greg had farmers out collecting insects for him, we had the bulk handling companies collecting insects. Uh, we just learned so much through collaboration. Uh, the National Resistance Management Strategy, it's not just a piece of paper listing, you know, do this, do that, do that. It's a really a working, living document with lots of information about how to use these chemicals properly. It's something that can just be updated as we go along. Um, alternatives, as I said, a very difficult thing to do. It sounds easy, but it's a very difficult thing to do. And again, we need to congratulate the West Australians. They came up with a silica product and the phosphine, uh, sorry, the, um, the nitrogen fumigation product. Delivery and adoption, um, all this stuff is useless unless people are going to hear about it and use it. Uh, we, we had impact, Dave Eagling developed these impact sites so we could demonstrate uh, best practice to growers and to the bulk handling companies. Uh, the biosecurity officers were, were appointed by the Plant Health Australia and through the state government departments, not directly in our program, but related to us. Part of their work was this grain area. Um, we had close links with the uh, GRDCs, the Grain Research and Development Corporation's National Grain Storage Team, and there's a a fantastic team who do tremendous work, but we were able to feed our, our data and our research through that team to get out to growers. Um, and on farm, uh, we made a lot of penetration with aeration for farmers and seal silos, better fumigation for farmers. And they, as a program leader, they were the highlights for me for this program. <coughs> Oops. Turn it around, okay. All right, so um, impacts and legacy. Um, these are just my opinions, they aren't necessarily shared by the CEO. But the first question we should ask is, were the objectives achieved? You know, what, what we set out to do, was it achieved? So really it was about, the first two objectives are really about phosphine and managing phosphine resistance. And if you look at the resistance monitoring data, in 2007 we st when we started, the strongest resistance to phosphine was in about 7% of populations across Australia. And in, 19, in, sorry, in 2015, it was in about 10% of populations. And I would say that's a pretty good effort. Uh, we've maintained the resistance and contained the resistance quite well. Uh, and in Western Australia, actually, resistance hardly occurs. And when it does, it's pounced on by the state government there. Um, you compare that with what's happening with strong resistance in other countries, there's been a few surveys overseas. In India, almost every population you sample has strong resistance. In the USA, they did a, a, a relatively small survey, but 60% of the, the strains they picked up, the samples they picked up, had strong resistance. Vietnam, 80%. Brazil, 74%. So it's just out of control in those countries. But this industry in Australia has managed to contain that resistance. Um, and we're still supplying insect-free, residue-free, high-quality grain to the markets. Uh, the Ecology Project achieved its, its aims. We know so much more about ecology of those insects now, outside the silos, where they go, how they move, the gene flow. 
Uh, we developed alternatives and the capacity building was achieved, especially in Western Australia, and we had a number of excellent PhD students. So what's the legacy? What are we leaving behind? Um, to me, the collaboration, I think, will go on. The industry, the researchers and so forth, that'll keep going into the future and such an important thing. The capacity has been built and hopefully we can build on that. Um, the changing rain protection practices, well, that's already happened and happening. Uh, the National Resistance Management Strategy is in place and that's a, a document people will, will keep updating and it's being looked after by the National Working Party on Grain Protection and they'll just take that forward. The knowledge we have, especially on the ecology and genetics of these insects, is just a, a tremendous foundation for going forward in the future. And those alternatives also give us, you know, potential to not, not replace phosphine, but we, we can augment phosphine in the future. Um, and I think that's where I'd like to finish. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Paul Kelly. I'm a broadacre grain farmer from Minganew in the west, midwest of West Australia. I farm about 400 kilometres north of Perth and inland from the coastal town of Dongra. And, um, this photo was taken about, about a week ago. At the moment, we're in the process of completing our 43rd wheat crop, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to get this one right. Up until that photo, we hadn't had rain for three months, but uh, about the last four days, I've had 40 mil, so we're pretty cocky. Now, I've been fortunate enough to be on the Western Panel of Grains Research and Development Corporation for the past six years and uh, my term came to an end in August last year. I was, whilst there I was either invited or co-opted on the Grain Advisory Panel of the PRBC, PBCRC, which is funded by Grain, Grain Corp, GRDC, Viterra and CBH. PBCRC has worked hard to bring benefits, real benefits to farmers, and one of their, re one of their research projects was the aeration of silos. So, you read that and I'll carry on here. As farmers, we think we're pretty special and we, we sometimes think rules don't apply to us. Uh, uh, that was mentioned this morning in the panel session. What I mean by that is West Australian farmers and farmers in general, we have overused herbicides, fungicides, and now we're working our way through the list of pesticides. You know that old saying, doing the same thing each year and expecting a different, different result, well that's us. In regards to herbicides, we now have world-class chemical resistance, very proud, and um, you know, many of our chemicals failing. We're getting around the problem though by using different techniques such as you know, rotations, windrow burning, chaff carts, Harrington weed destructors, and mixing more in, uh, expensive chemicals. With grain storage, it has evolved over the last half century, uh, 20th century, we saw a huge growth in the uh, use of um, chemical pesticides and fumigates. And um, Pat Collins has given a fantastic rendition of what happens with phosphine, so I'll give a bit of a run too. For many years, phosphine has been the backbone of the grain protection across Australia and is relatively inexpensive at much less than a dollar a tonne. As with any chemical or fumigant, we need to be aware of resistance issues. And if we lose phosphine, the next generation will have a different, difficult time maintaining the stored stored grain quality. We are already seeing phosphine resistance on farm across Australia, not so much in West Australia, but as Pat referred, you know, we have, I think there's about four or five sites there and they, the government just covered the sites, the sheds, everything with uh, big tarps and bombed every insect inside. Um, but we need to um, maintain the integrity of our grain and um, yeah, if resistance in, uh, increases, we're going to be in trouble. In West Australia, the, the majority of the grain is stored and sold through bulk handling groups such as uh, CBH, negating the need for a lot of unfarm storage. However, this is gradually changing and more people are building more and more unfarm storage. PBC, PBCRC took this on board and in conjunction with CBH, our local grower group, the Minganurin group, they conducted trials of the aim of <coughs> dramatically reducing pests in stored grain through aeration of grain silos. Around the world, there's been little research in developing practical and cost-effective storage, stored grain technology, so it's a credit to PBCRC 
for seeing the needs of the research and reinvesting our future. The air ocean trial was conducted over four farms in my district using different on-farm storage setups. Industrial strength fans were driven by mains electricity and generators uh, placed at the bottom of silos, providing a constant circulation of airflow through the grain. The aim of aeration is to create uniformity by lowering and stabilising grain temperatures throughout the stack. Aeration of silos helps in four main areas, preventing mould, inhibiting insect development, maintaining seed viability and reducing grain moisture. Without aeration, grain temperatures will be maintained at the warm harvest temperatures for long periods of time, providing an ideal environment for insects to thrive and mould to thrive. This is a great photo. Throughout this trial, we have discovered that air work, um, aeration works. It's affordable, it produces results. This image demonstrates the different volumes of insects collected from a silo that uses aeration technology and without aeration. As you can see, the significantly higher ones, higher in the one on the right. According to Deep Herd, it has been estimated that between one quarter and one third of the world's crop is lost each year due to storage, largely attributed to insect attack. And further, grain which is not lost can be severely reduced in quality through insect damage. Aeration on farm storage is a promising strategy that we can use to combat the evil of weevils, keep our grain at a high quality and help us farm profitably in the future. I'd like to thank um, Ben White, you know, he gave me um, some of his slides, and also David Eagling when he was working with PBCRC, and thank you for listening to me. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Philip Clamp. I work for um, Grain Corp Operations Limited, and I'm um, also chairman of the Grains Advisory Panel uh, in the CRC. Now, Pat talked about um, the CRC's uh, activities um, and focused on phosphine from a research uh, aspect. I'm going to focus on phosphine from an end user aspect. However, the themes in Pat's talk are spookily similar to mine. Phosphine is the most widely used grain fumigant in the world. Nothing comes close to phosphine. It's available in a whole host of formulations. It's been used over seven decades. Think of any chemistry that might come close to that. There really is not a lot. But it's been used, it's been abused. Um, you've seen the outcomes of that abuse uh, in respect of resistance. But I'm going to talk about a few other ways the abuse um, places it under threat. It's cheap, it's versatile, it's really easy to use. Pat mentioned it's also acceptable to all world markets regarding its um, maximum residue limits. Technically, with the exception of um, uh, grain that you would classify as organics. Phosphine is irreplaceable. There will never be chemistry like phosphine, given that it was developed so long ago under different circumstances. The world's a bit different nowadays if you try and register anything like inventing phosphine again. But it is irreplaceable. A lot of hort folk in the room here. I'd suggest that phosphine to the grains industry is even far, far more important to what dimethyl dimethoate was to hort. Now, Pat talked about widespread and growing insect resistance. Uh, this is not new. We've known about this for quite some time, and it's been a deliberate strategy within the CRC to come up with products to extend phosphine's uh, working life, as it were. However, there are many control failures that we see in the supply chain. 
particularly in the East Coast. We are operating in a deregulated export market. There are many different channels to port. It's not like the good old days where everyone knew their place, where a marketer knew his place, where rail transport knew their place, where a bulk handler knew their place, where an exporter knew their place. And they operated in their own individual compartments. But they operated in a, operated in a very cooperative fashion. That fashion, fortunately um, born through regulation, still exists in grains. That's why grains has a really fabulous and cooperative, pre-competitive attitude, really, to research, to collaboration and the like. Nonetheless, we've got a different supply chain nowadays. So you've got different channels, different methods of um, cargo assembly, as it were, and to maintain control under common access or open access arrangements, it's pretty difficult. So you've gone from a lot of planning, a lot of control, to um, open access, just in time, not a lot of control, and this helps um, control failures in the supply chain. When I say control failures, I'm talking about um, insects detected throughout the supply chain that we would normally be expected to have been controlled within the supply chain or within historic supply chains. Now, what's the effects of control failures? Well, you've got to retreat them at port. You've got to replace a cargo. It might mean getting a new train or several train loads down to port. It might mean organising a fleet of trucks. It could uh, mean demurrage to a ship. All of those things cost. All of this supply chain dislocation uh, just increased costs. But hey, that's the price of deregulation. It's the price of competition. However, it doesn't do any favours when you're trying to control insects in your supply chain. And it doesn't do any favours when phosphine is under threat, not only through um, the natural process of um, selection for resistance. There's environmental consequences or, or, or factors. You've got lower um, uh, you've got lower um, MRLs, you have lower ground level concentrations of phosphine. These are regulated um, uh, air quality standards, both here and overseas. EPAs of all persuasions look at these values and um, industry users must respond to these values. These values don't go up. MRLs, ground level concentrations of phosphine or other fumigants, controlling them, they do not get relaxed, they get reduced. Same thing happens of course for methyl bromide, sulfur fluoride and a bunch of other things. Worker safety places phosphine and indeed other fumigants under threat. Every day there are truckloads of grain moved all around Australia which are dosed with phosphine, some to dangerously high levels. I wouldn't like to be defending phosphine use um, if one happened to overturn, particularly in front of a you know, hospital or a, a childcare centre. It's probably not make, going to make good press. Um, regrettably, there are probably a couple of deaths every year um, through uh, shipboard use of phosphine. In transit use of phosphine is quite common in trade from Australia, but it's quite commonplace in uh, North America, Europe, and regrettably, um, shipboard deaths through leaks of phosphine into crew quarters um, are certainly not uncommon. 
you've got, I guess, other regulatory events. I've mentioned air quality standards. Uh, you've got increased um, scrutiny of activities. Uh, you, you've got increasing regulation. Some of it's applied, some of it is uh, not applied. Nonetheless, um, these are examples of where phosphine becomes under threat. Probably the biggest threat is threatened to, uh, is threats to markets. If we do get something wrong, uh, our value of grains uh, exported a year, I've had a look at uh, ABER uh, stats, and it's probably about 25 billion per annum for crops. Uh, loss of markets, uh, uh, if you lose a major market, uh, you can very easily wipe, you know, a couple or five billion off your um, export income a year. These threats are real. We do lose markets occasionally. We lost access to canola to Japan for uh, pesticide breaches. Uh, we have restrictions on canola to EU uh, regarding the threat of pesticide restrictions. Um, when I say pesticide restrictions, uh, MRL breaches. How has the PBCRC helped to preserve phosphine? Pat's covered most of these, but um, look, uh, the resistance monitoring provides a baseline. Johan mentioned how important it was to have a baseline regarding what was on Barrow Island to start with and what remains there. Um, so it's a decision for, it's a basis for decision making for, um, for us. It, um, allows us to plan, to target, chem to target treatments, rotation of chemistry, consider alternatives, reinforce the basics of doing pest control correctly. Uh, it, uh, Pat mentioned uh, the National Resistance Management Plans. Grain Corp use these routinely. Really important to do the basics right. Um, you don't have to be a genius to do the basics right regarding um, making sure you're not selecting for resistance. So the basics are rotation and the like. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Pat talked about the research outcomes were in, that were important. Uh, most, just in, in closing, the really important one, and I don't want to steal Michael Sunder, I'm really looking forward to his presentation on Davron, is in terms of product, most important uh, thing to come out of the CRC in terms of product is uh, Davron, as far as I'm concerned. Davron could be the new big thing for controlling insects. It won't replace phosphine, but it'll extend its life even further. But it could be a new generation of pest management in grains and in other durable commodities. Uh, yeah, it's, it, 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 if we can get it to work, it could be, uh, it could be that important. Other, I guess, uh, things that were really important regarding the CRC from a, an, an end user uh, standpoint are, are the capacity building uh, the PhDs, the collaboration, and the knowledge transfer. Thank you. We, we have got a little bit of time, Phil, so don't run away, because I think we should, we should take a question or two. Um, so from the floor, are there any questions uh, for the first three speakers in uh, uh, Phil, uh, Paul, or Pat? And if not, I've got a question for you, Phil. I think Pat's um, slide suggested that 99% of um, grain insects in India, I think it was, were resistant to phosphine. You mentioned phosphine is the mecca of um, chemicals, and if we lose it, then the grain industry is in serious peril. Um, what's the likely cost of the loss of phosphine as, from an industry perspective? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, it's, it's incalculable. Uh, I mentioned uh, the value of, um, of grains exports 
per annum, 25 billion or thereabouts, give or take. Um, if you lose it, you potentially lose markets. Uh, that's the big one. You can control it with other um, substances, other fumigants, other chemistry, but they're more costly and they limit the markets. So the cost is incalculable. Thank you.